We are taking you behind the scenes of the National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. With unprecedented access to the scientists pushing boundaries and shaping our future, this show will take you to the cutting edge and beyond. And whether you're an expert yourself or just science curious, this is the show for you. Welcome to the Turing Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Turing Podcast. I'm your host today, Aoife, and I'm joined by Sally. Hi, it's really great to be here. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. No problem. Thanks for helping us. And today we're really excited to be joined by Dr. Tamsin Edwards. Hi, Tamsin. Hi, it's great to be here. Yeah, so so lovely to have you. So um, the reason you're here is because you very recently give a cheering lecture about your work. And for anyone unfamiliar, the cheering lectures are the Institute's flagship event series. And this year, they're organized in partnership with the Royal Institute of Great Britain, with the goal of making AI and data science research accessible to everyone. So, Tamsin, how, how did that go, giving that lecture? Uh, well, I, I hope it went well for the audience. I really enjoyed doing it. The Royal Institution are a fantastic group to work with because um, not only is it such an iconic venue, uh, but they have a great demo team, of course, who work on the Christmas lectures. So something that was really new for me um, in this talk was being able to work with them to come up with physical demos of the concepts in my lecture. Um, And then the other thing that was new was the fact that it was a Turing lecture meant that I really focused on the machine learning side and the methods, which actually I really love to talk about. I really like saying how climate science works and how we get the numbers rather than just what the numbers are. So it was a kind of a perfect pairing for me. That sounds great. Um, So I probably should have asked you this first, actually. Of Could you tell us a bit about who you are and your background for anyone who isn't familiar with your work or maybe missed the lecture? Yeah, I uh, I guess the basic idea is that I'm a physicist by training originally. So I did physics at Manchester uh, back in the day uh, and a PhD in particle physics. And then I moved into climate science, um, originally running the big global climate models. Uh, I was working with scientists at the Met Office in the UK using their model. Um, but I got really bitten by the bug of uncertainty in that project because um, – on the project uh, was a fantastic statistician who's become a real mentor to me and a, and a great friend, John T. Rouge. And he uh, taught me a lot about how we try to explore and understand uncertainties in complex computer models and try and get a handle on it, especially when we don't necessarily have a lot of data, enough data, let's say, as much as we'd like to to test the models. Um, how do we make those predictions when they go out so far into the future? So then I kind of moved more into the uncertainty side of things. Um, and my next sort of main uh, research contract was looking at uh, ice sheets and sea level rise. So I kind of ended up pairing the two together and sort of slightly stealing some of the ideas I'd learnt from uncertainty in global climate models and then transferring them to predicting the future of the ice sheets um, and actually now these days also mountain glaciers as well. Uh, yeah, so it's been a real kind of um, uh, a bit of a circu- circuitous route around a few different things. Um, but yeah, here I am. And so I guess, I, I guess I'm kind of known for uncertainty in ice sheet and glacier model predictions, but actually the methods kind of apply to any kind of computer model. Yeah, that, that's super interesting that you, your background's in physics. It seems to be physicists appear everywhere in science. Like you guys are just here to answer all the questions. I know there's uh, there's a few slightly rude uh, cartoons from XKCD about physicists trying to interfere in everyone else's subjects. <laughs> so I guess you can um, you can sometimes go too far. And I think you know I very much, although my research is very focused on statistical concepts, I very much don't call myself a statistician because I'm really just doing the most basic versions of things, and then uh, kind of kind of to sell the idea of uncertainty to the physical scientists and the modelers and say, look here's what we can do to try and understand this better. Here are the kind of first steps, the basic steps, the slightly easier steps, uh, and then hopefully uh, let other uh, professional statisticians take over the more complex work after that. I think that's such a great thing about climate science is that we do, there are loads of us that come from many different backgrounds and we can all work together to solve these problems. So I've, I'm from an earth sciences background, but I work with geographers and physicists and statisticians as well. So um, yeah, I guess we, we can all throw our hat in the ring and 
and kind of come together and for these big team efforts so that's that's fab yeah exactly so we have some questions from the online audience during the lecture that you didn't have a chance to answer on the night um so if it's okay we're going to launch in with with some of those questions so our first question comes from jim um who asks as glaciers melt there's surely less weight pushing down on the land beneath them does this land rebound over time at all yeah, great question. Um, I wonder if Jim already uh, knows a bit about this um, because the answer is yes. <laughs> um, so exactly, when we had the big, uh, the much bigger ice sheets on the land that we had in the last ice age, uh, they were really pushing down that land. It kind of sank, and as the as the ice has melted uh, since that last ice age, the the land is still rebounding now um, and will carry on doing so. And the same, obviously, with with the ice that we're losing now um, from the planet. So you get this kind of rebound. Um, you also get the opposite around the edges. You get a kind of bulge. You could imagine if you were um, pushing down somewhere and then the land goes up around the edges and then the opposite happens when the ice has melted. And it's a really important uh, aspect of thinking about the regional implications of sea level rise, uh, what the land is doing in different parts of the world. It's really important. We had, you know, big ice sheets over North America and Northern Europe. And so, for example, Scotland is kind of rising up uh, while the south uh, of England is kind of sinking. And so that has a big impact on how they'll be affected by sea level rise. Scotland a bit less because of that land going up as a rebound and then the south of England more because it's sinking. Uh, so it's a really important effect, definitely. And it, it depends uh, a lot on also the the um, the sort of stiffness of the mantle uh, as well, uh, the kind of how how bendy, if you like, the ground is, um, how how quickly it's rebounding. So do you have to account for that in these models of sea level rise? It's a good question because actually, uh, like a lot of things in climate science, it depends on what time scale you're looking at. So in my Turing lecture, I was focusing on a lot of my work focuses on predictions for this century. So out to the year 2100. Um, and actually on those time scales, people tend not to include it in the predictions because you have to add in another computer model. It sort of complicates things. Uh, it might be slower to run, but also, um, it's just simpler not to have it there because actually we think it's not not so important on that kind of timescale. But once you start to get out to two, three hundred years and longer, it becomes really important. Um, and you really have to make sure that you include it with these with these models of, of what we call glacial isostatic adjustment or GIA. So if, if you don't mind, can I maybe just chip in on that with maybe a, a naive point of view from what I understand about these models? Of course. So you end up coming up with like a, a really broad range of possibilities, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, how do you end up coming up with a decision of what's the most probable or what are we going to tell people is likely to happen? Oh, that's my favourite question, I think. <laughs> because it's all about thinking uh, about not just the uncertainties, but the relative probabilities of different things happening. So, you know, there are huge research fields looking into the best ways of doing this. I think sort of broadly speaking, I guess what we do is if we have uh, a bunch of different models or a bunch of alternative simulations, we test them against uh, observations of the past. So we run that model, say, for the 20th century or the recent few decades. Um, and then we score it against how well it did at reproducing reality. And, um, you know, that's important information. You wouldn't expect any model to be perfect, but you you can do things like score them or you can sort of rank them based on how close they are to reality. Um, and so the kind of the simple answer to that in a way is that you then can sort of give those models or those versions of models the most um, weight in the future. So you can kind of give mo the, the sort of balance of probability, if you like, to those models and, and say there's perhaps less likelihood that the other models project predictions are going to be right. Uh, but you, you still keep them in in there, but you kind of downweight them. There's a bit of a complication though, because uh, usually these models will predict multiple different things, especially something like a global climate model they're predicting. Temperature and rainfall and cloudiness and, I don't know, things in the ocean and like, incredibly complex models. 
So you can imagine that if you uh, rank all your big climate models by temperature, then one model is like the best, but then you rank them all for rainfall and actually a different model is the best. And then you do the same for, um, I don't know, uh, saltiness of the ocean or whatever else you're looking at. And so you, you can't necessarily, you usually can't find a sort of clear winner amongst models. Um, so I think one of the things that's really important about the process of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC that does these big assessment reports, is is not only to compare all the different models and, and evaluate them like with observations and, and say how well are they doing, but actually to kind of keep the whole collection of predictions for the future and not actually reduce it too much, not throw any models out and not downweight the the outliers, because actually we want to make sure we've captured all possible uncertainty about the future. We haven't been overconfident um, uh, because actually there isn't necessarily going to be a clear winner. And uh, you, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to sort of put all your eggs in one basket with one model, basically. That sounds like a really sensible way of doing it and approaching it. <laughs> I, yeah. I like it. It, 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 but also it's, it's so important because um, I think a lot of the confusion are, that comes around understanding climate predictions and maybe science in general is when we're predicting these ranges of possibilities and, and we might also give a most likely value because most of the probability is, is around a certain value, you know, sea level rise is maybe most likely to be half a metre, say, in a given amount of time you have this kind of minimum and you have this maximum and you have this most likely and they're, they're all doing different things. You know, sometimes people want to know the most likely, they want to know the most probable outcome. And some people want to know the highest, you know, worst case maximum possible sea level rise. Uh, and so if you find yourself comparing different predictions, sometimes they're doing different things. They're focusing on different things. And, you know, uh, you have to make sure that someone's getting the information that they are asking for and that they understand w what that is. And, and you have to kind of unpack that a little bit. So I, I think that that's really interesting. It almost sounds like it's, it depends on what your outlook on life is, depending on how you feel about things. That's kind of true, because if you imagine uh, your outlook on life is going to be uh, dependent on things like, are you the manager of a nuclear power plant on the coast? Uh, in which case, you might want to know the worst case scenario uh, and very long term predictions. Um, or are you just thinking of, I don't know, uh, having a holiday by the sea, in which case you don't mind too much or maybe buying a place by the sea. Maybe you don't, uh, uh, you're not worrying about the long time scale, but also you're thinking, well, what's most likely? I'm not going to just take the worst case. I'm just going to take the most likely. So in, in a way, it does depend on your outlook. It depends on your sort of attitude to risk and the things that you're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me like people generally seem to be a bit down on a lot of these things. And actually there's a question from Sue that kind of uh, proves this point where they've asked, um, at what level of warming does ice melt in places like Greenland and Antarctica become unstoppable? Yeah, really important question. Lots of people uh, understandably and, and rightly concerned about the irreversible impacts of climate change. Um, and I think it's, it's quite hard to say uh, you know, a, a single number, right? Clearly there's going to be uncertainty here. Um, what we, I guess the main things to say are that even at, even at the current level of warming, even at one and a half degrees of warming, which is about the minimum we can imagine keeping global temperatures to, um, we think there's some risk of, uh, for example, large parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet eventually being lost, uh, if, especially if we keep at that temperature and we can't reduce it back down to the, the pre-industrial levels. So, so there's definitely some risk now, and we're not sure if we might be already triggering some irreversible loss, particularly from West Antarctica. And the other thing is that we don't necessarily know if there's a sort of hard limit or what that limit is in temperature, but we do know that it's going to become more and more likely the more warming there is. So if you look at, for example, the IPCC assessment from last year, it said, you know, there's some evidence it could happen between one and a half to, to two degrees or even already has started. Um, and then once you get up to kind of two, three to five degrees of warming, which we obviously really hope we're going to avoid, then it becomes much, much more probable. We think, um, you know, it would play out over a long time. It would take, uh, you know, potentially thousands of years um, to lose you know, most of the Greenland ice sheet or most of West Antarctica, but it becomes much more likely at those very high warming levels. 
that's really interesting, Tamsin. Thanks for answering that question. Um, our next question is about permafrost. So um, permafrost is ground below zero degrees Celsius, which is permanently frozen. Um, and one of the audience members asked, what are the implications of permafrost melting for your kind of work? Yeah, well, um, we I guess we normally say permafrost thawing because, you know, it's like a sort of defrosting something from your freezer rather than melting like a piece of ice. Um, I think the main thing we are worried about uh, in terms of climate change is the release of carbon into the atmosphere, uh, which is obviously what the, the question is going to be worried about. So that comes from carbon dioxide and also methane being released as the ground thaws, as it warms up um, from all the kind of vegetation and bacterial processes that are that are going on and decomposition and so on. Um, I think this is one area where we we do think it's a significant concern. We think it's important, but I think probably there's a sometimes a public perception that it's going to be a bigger uh, thing in the next few decades than than scientists now believe. So if we look at the, it depends on how much warming you get, of course. Like the more warming we have, again, the more thawing of the permafrost we're going to have, and therefore the more release of carbon into the atmosphere, which obviously is going to cause more warming and and be that amplifying loop. But I think the predictions for this century are between maybe um, carbon that's kind of equivalent to about one to 10, maybe 12 or 13 years of our current emissions. So if we were to emit at our current rate for 10 years, uh, that's about how much could be released from the permafrost this century. Does that make sense? So it's not something that's on the scale of we're going to end up with huge runaway warming and we're going to end up on a 10 degree planet or we're going to end up on Venus. It's more like something that the the more it happens, the less carbon budget we have to emit from our own like lifestyles from our own industry and so on. We have this idea of a, a carbon budget. We have to limit the amount of CO2 carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere if we want to keep warming to one and a half degrees or even below two degrees. And so the permafrost basically knocks a chunk off that if it's releasing a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. And, and it could be quite a big chunk. It could be up to around half the budget for one and a half degrees or up to around uh, a fifth of the budget for keeping to two degrees. So it's important, but it's not at the scale of we're going to turn into a sort of completely uh, boiling planet if it happens. Yeah, and going back to uncertainty, I suppose it must also be quite difficult to quantify exactly how much how much ground is frozen on the earth as well. Yeah, how much carbon is in the soil? Exactly. These are, you know, uh, living processes and they can be quite hard to measure um, exactly. And, and to understand, to put them into a computer model, to understand how they interact with the warming, what are the different, these feedback loops, these amplifying factors and then sort of dampening factors, how do they add up? Uh, and yeah, we tend to sort of think of carbon released per degree of warming to try and put all that together but yes yeah, it's, it's definitely it's quite a challenging area of climate science i'd say but it's definitely included i think there's a there's a myth that climate scientists don't think about this or they don't include it in climate models amongst a few people and that i've heard and um you know we definitely think about it and we definitely predict it and and we try to understand it as best that we can well it, it definitely sounds like from that because you mentioned like um things like how, how much carbon is trapped in soil it sounds like that's quite quite a quite a stretch of topics and backgrounds and expertise you need in this work? It is. I mean, I don't work on permafrost. Um, so what I know is more from things like, uh, well, I worked on a chapter in the IPCC report um, that came out last year that was covering oceans and cryosphere. So therefore all the frozen bits of the planet, like the ice sheets, the glaciers, but also permafrost um, and sea ice as well, floating ice um, and sea level rise. So, you know, obviously I was working with the scientists that were writing those parts. I also teach a bit about permafrost um, and we cover we cover quite a lot of topics in, um, if you permit me to plug my Radio 4 series, uh, 39 Ways to Save the Planet. We covered a lot of things around the the natural carbon cycle and methane cycle. So basically things like um, permafrost, peatlands and bogs, all these kind of soggy bits of the planet or frozen bits, the forests, um, how basically how the how the vegetation of the world, both on land and in and in the oceans, actually um, interacts with the climate through things like uh, exchanging carbon dioxide. So 
Yeah, so I suppose what I, what I really mean by that is like you must be working with lots of lots of different people and you must have to integrate lots of different ideas from different fields. Um, how, how do you end up coming to your agreements on things? Because surely everyone thinks their their area is the most important thing you should be modeling right now. <laughs> That's know? a great point. Let me try and think if I can uh, think of any examples of that. Uh, I, I wouldn't name any names. I think you you definitely um you definitely have d- different viewpoints from different scientists because of the different groups they've been working with and their different backgrounds. Um but I think that can be a strength actually because you know something like sea level rise you're bringing together scientists from all these different areas so there are global climate modelers there are people looking at ice sheets and glaciers the oceans there are people looking at you know how the earth's uh, ground is is um responding as we talked about um we uh, we have kind of uh, uh, people looking at satellite data as well as computer models and it means that um everyone has a different idea to bring you know we we often have things like different methods and approaches for i don't know comparing the computer models with data or you know the kind of ranking and scoring of of models or um i don't know the 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 different uh ways of making sure that the science is robust you can have different approaches to that and so therefore when we bring the different scientists together we often find we learn from each other uh so for example you know i started off in global climate modeling where they were doing a lot of the uncertainty work already um and then yeah and then i basically sort of tried to transfer some of that to to the ice sheet and glacier areas uh who hadn't really been doing it so much because they hadn't been so much in contact with that part of the field so i think that cross transfer is really helpful yeah, I think that wonderfully demonstrates how collaboration is really at the heart of modern science and everything we do as scientists. And um, I know Aoife and I really loved seeing the team photos in your Turing lecture from the model into comparison exercises where you ran hundreds of glacier prediction simulations. Um, it sounds like a huge undertaking. Like a lot of work goes into those those projects. So I'm curious as to how long it typically takes to set up and run each individual simulation and how many scientists works on each one. Mm. Well, those projects, uh, which were called um, the Ice Sheet Model Intercomparison Project, ISMIP, and the Glacier Model Intercomparison Project, Glacier MIP, uh, they were running for years. Uh, so kind of organisationally, um, as I mentioned in the Turing lecture, something like six years between the first meeting and the publications. Um, so, so that's the biggest part, really, is actually deciding how you're going to do things, uh, setting up the processes for things like um, making sure all the computer models are putting things into the same format so you can compare them easily so that people are comparing the right numbers with each other. Um sort of making sure all the inputs to the computer models are kind of standardized. So for example, what uh, climate prediction each ice sheet model or glacier model is using for the future. So you kind of standardize those. Um, And you have to do a lot of moving data around the world and, you know, processing, post-processing, all that stuff. So that side is is actually the really slow bit. And especially I should say that these projects aren't actually necessarily funded. So people are kind of doing them in their spare time around other things, uh, around their other research, around their lecturing and that kind of thing. In terms of the actual models and simulations, uh, the ice sheet and glacier models a sort of the kind of medium end of complexity, I'd say. So anywhere between could be a few minutes to a few weeks uh, to run one simulation. So the most complex ice sheet models would be perhaps a cut two or three weeks, um, but the most simple glacier models could be, you know, an, almost an instant if it was very simple. Um, in terms of how many scientists in that uh, big international comparison, there could be anywhere between probably one and three scientists working on the simulations that were being put into that project. Um, You know, usually one or two that would be sort of mainly in charge. But in terms of the actual history of that model and how it's kind of set up and designed and developed, that could have been tens of of scientists over the years and the big global climate models, hundreds, absolutely hundreds of scientists over decades of work have been layering, you know, more and more complexity and more and more refinement into these computer models. Um, And I think one of the challenges of what I do, because I'm interested in exploring uncertainty, what that basically means is that you're going to a computer modeler who might have only run 
one simulation or five or 10 and you're saying, please, can you run a hundred or, you know, please, can you run (laughs) many more than you were planning to do? Because I want to know, even if you think they're not going to be as realistic and as good a simulation, but it's still useful information. And I really want you to uh, basically do more (laughs) work than you were planning to. So you have to kind of sell the idea of like why that's useful and why that's important um, so that they you know, submit them to their supercomputers or computing clusters so that they spend the extra time to set up those extra simulations as well. Sounds like a lot of work to to manage and try and get everybody on the same page. So Absolutely. I think, you know, the the people that run these MIPS, these model into comparison projects, they're absolutely wonderful. You know, I mentioned them in my talk. Sophie Nowicki uh, ran the big ice sheet one. Um, ben Marzion is one of the scientists who ran the glacier one. And it's, it takes a lot of... Um, you know, scientific expertise to understand all the different aspects of the project, but it does take those kind of personal skills to work with people who are, who are volunteering their time, um, for, for this endeavor. And, and the endeavor was the IPCC reports. That's what, what it was all designed to do. I love kind of picturing, picturing the globe of sci- groups of scientists in, in different locations, all working together to, to run these global models and, and kind of, yeah, have, have one collaborative output that seems yeah. really special of course and um of course with the pandemic um you know all our international meetings that were happening every perhaps year or two uh completely stopped and there are many authors of the study uh th- that i led in this work that i you know that i've never met you know many many of them i've never met so uh occasionally i if i present the work at conferences i ask you know how many people were you know on the study and they can give me a wave and because they were over 80 there's usually somebody in the conference so yeah it was a really global endeavor so we have another um, question from one of the audience members at the lecture, um, and they asked, in your simulations, do you run different glacier and climate models in different areas of the world, or do you run all of the models on every single glacier? Yeah, I guess it's a bit of both. So usually, you know, you would aim to run every model for everything that you're looking at, so that you've got the most data to compare and the, the most thorough exploration of uncertainty. Sometimes that's not possible. So, for example, for the glaciers, I mentioned there are something like 200,000 glaciers of the world. We group them into 19 regions. And so some of the glacier modelers weren't able to do all of the regions. Maybe their model was more complex. Maybe they didn't have as much time to to volunteer to the project. Um, And sometimes, yeah, so sometimes we have these regional climate models. uh, So they are looking at things like temperature and rainfall and snow and so on. And we just run them over the North Pole or the South Pole, basically, to to give a, a more detailed view of the climate for Greenland and Antarctica and we might try and use the same models for those but sometimes we end up having to use different ones um, for the North Pole and the South Pole basically. So yeah we definitely strive to use the same models everywhere so that we've got the most complete thorough exploration of uncertainty and we can cross compare as much as possible but inevitably these these simulations are computationally expensive, um, it's a lot of time for people to run and, and sometimes it's not possible. Mm. Um, going back to discussions of uncertainty, our next question from the audience was how do you incorporate uncertainty from these these models that you're running when you're applying machine learning to fill in the gaps between the data points? I know you, you touched on that in the lecture, but maybe you'd like some space to kind of explain that a little bit more. Yeah, this is a fantastic question. This is actually kind of at the heart of the whole study, really. Um, yeah, in my in my lecture, I, I gave a, an example, a, a sort of a metaphor for the machine learning that I was doing, where I I showed a constellation of stars, so the uh, Cygnus, the swan, which is like a kind of cross shape. And I got members of the audience to kind of draw the swan constellation. Uh, and I talked about how joining the dots in that way gives you a more complete picture because it's giving you information between the dots. And here the the dots are your are your different simulations. They're your data points, but you want to know the information between the dots. Um, and so that's what your machine machine learning is doing. And typically in the kind of machine learning that I do thinking about uncertainty for computer models in this way, we tend to do it for one computer model at a time. So you imagine you've got one cross of stars uh, and then you just neatly draw a line through that goes through all the dots and you go exactly through those dots because you've just got one quite simple set of, you know, pattern to kind of um, complete, if you like. But what we had here is 10 or 12 or 15 models. And so what you end up with is 
instead of a nice neat cross of stars, each of those stars is a whole cluster, is a whole blob of slightly different stars. You're almost kind of connecting up, I don't know, galaxies, if that was the, <laughs> if that was the metaphor. Um, and so what you do is you allow the machine learning to be more flexible. Uh, so there's a thing if people are interested in the technical side is you, the, the, people might have heard of a, an idea of using a nugget. And a nugget is basically like a little bit of a tolerance or wiggle room where instead of just going exactly through one dot, you know, you, you, you let the machine learning kind of go kind of quite close, uh, but not right through the dot. And, and that's helpful when you have a lot of data like that. It's got to find, it's got to navigate its way through a whole cloud of points. Uh, so basically that's the, that's the technical side is, um, is using this idea of a nugget, but it's, it's basically a bit of wiggle room so that it can find a path through all the models um, using all the information it's got uh, to try and account for that. And then, and then you try and you include all that uncertainty in the final predictions. You know, you have a, you don't just take that central path that the machine learning has taken. You also take uh, the full range of possible paths through that data. So the machine learning will give you a, a whole range of, of paths, um, you know, like an uncertainty interval, an error bar, really, uh, like a sort of a big wide swan neck instead of just the line down the middle. And you, you push all of that uncertainty into the prediction. So you don't throw it away. You keep it all. So you keep the uncertainty from all the different computer models and you keep the uncertainty of the machine learning itself because that has an inherent uncertainty and you put it all into the prediction so that you make sure you're not overconfident. I think that's such a wonderful way of describing it. You can really picture that even if our listeners haven't seen the lecture, they can picture the star constellation and the swan. And um, yeah, it's a really, really accessible way of of helping people to understand actually a really complex um, scientific uh, method. So Thank you. Yeah, I, it's fantastic. I, I, the one that I said in the lecture, the, the reason I really, and on Twitter as well, the reason I really love the metaphor, I was very pleased with myself when I came up with it, was, but the reason I love the metaphor is is really because uh, it includes an idea that the machine learning is uncertain. It has this kind of um, multiple possibilities, but also just like when you're drawing the constellation, there's a bit of uh, subjective judgment in there. The, you know, your expert has to kind of steer the machine learning a bit and say, well, you know, you've done something a bit crazy there. You've done something a bit silly. Actually, you want to kind of go a bit more in this direction or you you want to be less wiggly and more smooth, for example, is the is the main kind of judgment you'll give it. So you, you have this idea of um, not just multiple possibilities, but also the idea that you know, the machine learning needs the human, it needs the expert scientist to kind of give it a little bit of guidance, a little bit of boundaries, a few boundaries to make sure that it's not doing something silly uh, and that it's reflecting our understanding of how the physics works, you know, that it's that it's a, a smooth change rather than a very wiggly, rough change. And that that's our judgment that we put into it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like the idea, but yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm glad you like it. So Tamsin, I'm an observational scientist. I study the Antarctic ice sheet using satellite imagery. And in observation-based science, we often develop new research techniques when we have new data available. For example, if a new satellite mission is, is launched. So I'm wondering, how do these large modeling projects change when a new model is developed? How, how easy is it to incorporate new models into this existing body of work? Basically, people are really pleased when this happens, right? When, um, you know, it can take a lot of work, of course, to develop develop a completely new model. You tend to not see that happen um, from scratch that often, um, and especially not for the global climate models. Those are really huge, huge operations, uh, and that that's much less common. But in ice sheet and glacier models, which are simpler, um, you do see this uh, where you sometimes get a whole new model, and people are really pleased because it diversifies the the um, predictions and the approaches. It's another check. It's a, you, know, you always have choices in how you model things, how you simplify, how you make assumptions, how you do the calculations on a grid, which bits of physics you include, how you represent the stuff that you don't know in approximate ways, these things called parameterizations, uh, sort of hand wavy bits, basically. Um, and, and so it's really important to keep adding models. What happens more often, actually, particularly in these ice sheet and glassy models that are a bit simpler, is you can have parts of the model that get changed. So this is quite common um, for things like how the ice uh, 
kind of flows and slides on the bed, for example, when we don't really know that much necessarily about the bed underneath, especially Antarctica. Um, you know, is it kind of hard rock? Is it kind of waterlogged sediment? Uh, and those have a different um, implication for how the ice flows. And so you'll get models which will include a new kind of representation of ice sliding uh, to try and account for that. And those things will increase in sophistication. So you're not necessarily changing the whole model, but you're changing an important part of it that can really make a big difference to the um to the predictions. Uh, and so and so can the way you set up the model actually the the grid um you know the resolution of the grid, the size of the pixels that you're calculating, the the way that you kind of spin up the way that you start off the simulation all, all makes a big difference. Um and I think you know we we obviously you know we welcome that. There there's a, a glacier model which is modular and so it really encourages that OGGM, it's called Open um, Global Glacier Model. And so it really encourages that idea of plugging in, you know, new bits to try and improve different aspects of it. Um, and you get a certain amount of that of climate models. You have an ocean sort of component that gets moved around and shared or changed and stuff. So it tends to be more part of the model will will change based on new advances, based on new ideas about how to represent the physics. See, I, I find that um, really interesting. And it kind of goes back to like one of our original points about what it's like being a physicist in different fields of, I kind of have this impression of physicists like to simplify and abstract everything. So like you, you might know the joke of if a physicist was to model a duck, you have to first imagine a spherical duck. And that's from there yeah. you draw your models. So yeah, for, for us, it was a cow, but yes, yeah. <laughs> So um, I guess what, what I would like to know is like, how how much do you find like looking more at a high, higher resolution of your data? How does that, or of your model, sorry, how does that improve your outputs? Mm. Yes, you have to, I, I mentioned, I think in the, in the lecture or in the questions after, you do have to have, um, you know, we tend to call it a hierarchy of models of different complexity. Uh, so for example, um, for global climate, we have everything from incredibly complicated, what we call Earth system models that really try and simulate every possible process they can. Uh, they tend to try and have as high resolution as they can, so small grid cell size and many computations possible. Obviously, it gets very, very computationally expensive to run even on supercomputers. But you have a spectrum right through to... Um, like one equation for a climate model, something incredibly broad brush and simple. Uh, and so there the resolution, you know, the planet is basically one point, you know, it's just one number for temperature or, you know, something very, very simple like this. So you, you always have this hierarchy, um, but the resolution does really, really matter for, for certain aspects, I guess, of climate change more than others. But ice sheets uh, and particularly Antarctica, it's really important. We know that if we want to simulate the the movement of um, the edge of the ice sheet, which we call the grounding line, uh, so the bit that's grounded as opposed to floating it determines the sea level rise. Uh, we know that you really need a good resolution, certainly less than one kilometre, but ideally quite a lot less, to really get the kind of balance of forces right. Um, if you imagine as well, it's sitting on bedrock that's quite bumpy. And so if there's a kind of bumpy pinning point, like a spiky bit, it can sort of drag on the ice. Uh, so you kind of need to have that information in the model if you can. Um, so yeah, so all of these, all of these ice sheet and glacier models will try to be as high resolution as they can. Um, but even if they're lower resolution, because of course, if they're lower resolution, then they're quicker to run and you can explore more uncertainties. So there's a trade-off. So sometimes we use a mix of the two and we try to understand how much the results depend on resolution. For example, it's quite easy in an ice sheet model to go from, you know, I don't know, a, a four kilometer resolution to eight kilometer to 16 kilometers, uh, keep doubling or, or whatever. And and it's actually relatively easy to to look at that kind of relationship. How much does the result depend on that? And then you can kind of match the two kinds of models. You can do a few simulations with a really detailed model and lots of simulations with a cheap, simple model. And basically you use things like the machine learning actually to try and understand the relationship between the two and get the best of both worlds. Cool, thank you. I think that definitely answers my question. Um, and sort of just, just to think about this work as a whole and especially this theme of uncertainty. Do you think I could just ask, so especially for me, because I'm not, as I said, not a climate scientist myself, I seem to get a lot of 
and I know other people do as well, climate change associated anxiety. Like I feel really worried all the time, all this, like, it seems almost depressing news I see. Do you think this is justified? Um, or do you think we can be hopeful for what's happening? Or what would be your insights on that? Yeah, I was having exactly this conversation with my friend yesterday. Uh, she said, uh, so tell me, uh, are we screwed? And in fact, she didn't use the word screwed. Um, and in fact, she asked me, uh, as a climate scientist, how do you feel about people constantly asking, are we screwed? Because clearly, like, it's a thing that people ask a lot. And and the answer I gave her, which I quite often give, is it depends on what you mean by we, and it depends on what you mean by screwed. Um, so, you know, I think I think we have we there's a danger um, in the developed countries uh, who are very informed and very concerned about climate change that we get anxious um, for ourselves, uh, and I think we we shouldn't worry too much for ourselves because we have the money actually to adapt to quite a lot of climate change through things like um you know uh coastal defenses for example london is incredibly well protected um you know we're more resilient to extreme weather uh, because we have the money to sort of put things in place we have we can ensure our you know houses and our, our businesses so we don't lose everything in an extreme weather event so we have to think much more about well uh where are the vulnerable in the world? Uh, and at the moment, they're already not resilient to extreme weather. Of course, there are people around the world who who suffer very, very much from things like um, heat waves or storms. So I think we have to um, direct that anxiety into uh, working at, uh, I guess, more of a sense of agency. So what is it that we can actually do um, rather than sitting and worrying about it um, or kind of going into sort of shutdown about it or denial or closing the browser tab or skipping the page or whatever and actually think well what is it that I can do apart from you know talking about it is important you know whether it's talking on Twitter or talking to friends particularly I think is is important to say this stuff this stuff matters but to work out what you can do in terms of structural change whether it's in your own country for emissions whether it's uh, talking to your local government um, or local council representatives, whether it's talking to your local businesses, your place of work, these kind of bigger levers of change that, you know, your own individual emissions are obviously a small part of the picture. But if you could affect the bigger picture through these um, larger institutions and larger levers, then that obviously is is a is a point of um of agency and of of doing something um and of course working out what is possible for developing countries there's a lot of talk at the moment about um the how to finance uh the the impacts of climate change the the the, the aftermath of extreme weather how to support developing countries to skip the um fossil fuel intensive energy sources and go straight to the low carbon energy sources so anything we can do that helps that process uh means that we're just getting on with it i think i think anxiety is understandable but it can be paralyzing and it can also be a luxury and actually if you're facing the impacts of climate change then you just have to get on with it <laughs> you have to work out how to adapt your house and you have to work out how to live in your community and you have to work out how to um uh, you know affect change so i think you know i think if we turn it away from ourselves and our fear for ourselves and actually what she, what can we do and what can we influence and what can we understand of the wider world that's that's that would be my advice okay so so your your general take home message then would be don't don't ignore it don't don't just bury your head in the sand essentially absolutely because you know i think there's a there's kind of a myth that um absolutely nothing is happening on climate change I think this is a very common idea that nothing is happening. Now, of course, things aren't happening fast enough. It's absolutely true that things aren't happening fast enough, but it's not true that nothing's happening. And 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 it's happening for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's um actually policies around climate change, you know, intentional change, like um, I don't know, phasing out fossil fuel vehicles or, you know, gas boilers or uh whatever else it is. Uh and sometimes it's sort of uh, almost accidental, you know, we're getting more efficient uh, because it's good to be more energy efficient. It's cheaper and it's, you know, the, the technology is going in that direction anyway, that businesses are kind of changing in these directions anyway. Um, you know, people are 
I don't know, changing diets, not just because of carbon emissions, but because they know that it's healthier to eat a few more vegetables and a bit less red meat, you know. And so I think we have the, a multitude of ways in which, you know, our emissions are slowing down. Hopefully they peak soon. Um, I'm, I'm not denying that it's not fast enough at all. It's, it's very much not fast enough, but it's not that nothing is happening. So we just have to work out how to accelerate and broaden the things that are happening and work out the barriers to that, work out what the, the benefits are and focus on, on those um, so that we can accelerate it, basically. I think it's also really important to have have hope in that sense, in that, like you say, you can kind of, in working towards solving climate change, if you like, or, or trying to mitigate some of the impacts of climate change, we will often improve our lives anyway. So as you mentioned, eating eating less less red meat and being healthier, but also um, reducing our, our usage of, of cars and walking and cycling more and reducing um, levels of, of pollution. We're, we're improving our lives on this journey anyway. So, so I think it's important to have, have hope and be mindful of, of those things as well. Exactly. And I think we're getting a lot better at um, the kind of systems thinking we need to make sure that, for example, a climate change um, action or solution isn't harming, you know, isn't polluting or isn't harming biodiversity. And those are sort of big trade-offs we have to be careful of. Um, but yeah, ab- absolutely. I think um, I think there's a greater awareness of the much greater awareness now of the what we call the co-benefits of acting on climate change, but also of the economic benefits, actually, that it's cheaper to act on climate change and decarbonize uh, than it is to pay for the impacts later. Cool. Well, you've, you've definitely given me a lot to think about. I'm going to, need to go process this for a bit, if I'm being honest. Good, um, I think. <laughs> so um, I'd just like to say um, thanks again to Sally for joining today and helping me out with this because... Well, I, I'm no no expert in climate change, and it's been really good to have to have your thoughts on this. Thanks for having me. It's been it's been an absolute pleasure. And of course, thank you so much, Tamsin, for joining us as well. Just a real pleasure to talk to both of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank thank you so much for the lecture as well, and, and yeah, taking the time. It's been lovely. Thank you. Um, I suppose I'd just like to ask one more thing just before we close out here: of um, Are you on social media, or do you have anywhere else you'd like to shout out? Any suggestions for where people can get more information, um, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, I, I'm on I'm on Twitter while it lasts. Uh, so I am um, at Flimsin, F L I M S I N. Uh, it's an old nickname, um, and uh, I have a blog which you can find from my Twitter profile. But also, it is allmodels.plos, P O L P L O S dot org. So that's the Public Library of Science, P L O S. So if you if you kind of search for all models are wrong um, and my name, then you'd find the blog. I don't post very often there, but when I do, I try and think hard about it. It's more like a sort of occasional reflective place rather than a sort of uh, speedy news reactive kind of a blog. Uh, but yeah, but I'm on, but I'm on Twitter and um, uh, I just had a uh, like many many climate scientists. I just had an essay printed in um, Greta Thunberg's new book. Uh, my essays about the impacts of different levels of warming, one and a half, two and four degrees. And that's very much based on IPCC assessments. You know, it's not my own kind of personal view. It's the, it's really a kind of a, a brief summary, uh, accessible summary of the IPCC statements. Um, but yeah, I think that those are the, those are the main ones. Wonderful. Well, thanks again, everyone. Um, this has been lovely. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. The show is hosted by me, B. Costa Gomez, Ed Calstri, Joe Dungate, Christina Last, and Anika York. Music for this podcast is produced by Jam and Sun. You can listen and follow via the link in the description or by searching Jam and Sun on Instagram.